Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today I would like to tell you about a single monoid of which I would like to study uh, next time it's representation theory, but just show you a little bit how it works. Kind of an example monoid, um, how representation theory of monoid works. And it's one of my favorite ones, the Brouwer monoid, which goes back to work of Richard Brouwer in the 30s-ish. Um, at the mid of the 30s, end of the 30s, a little bit hard to track down. Of course, I know when the paper was published, but I would suspect that Richard Brouwer worked a little bit more on this before. So maybe let's say it's 35. Uh, it doesn't really matter. So it's it's quite old by now. Kind of, kind of a nice idea, kind of a nice um, picture. And I would like to explain it quite differently than in the original motivation. And um, I would like to motivate it by using the cobordism approach. Uh, so we'll see. And but in the end, what I would like to do, not in this video anymore, but in the end, what I would like to do is to apply H reduction to this monoid and study its representation theory. And it's very smooth and it had a very nice result, actually. Okay, but first I need to define what I'm talking about, right? I need to define the Brouwer monoid, which is already cool in itself and the contents of this video. So if you would like to see some nice diagrams, this is your video. Um, so don't click off the video. Of course, you're free to click off the video. But anyway, uh, so here's the picture. I have my bubble here, my universe of cobordisms, the category of one-dimensional cobordisms, if you want. And that just means the following. I have zero-dimensional cobordisms, which has us points. And so here are three and I have five and I have a map from three to five, which is a collection of lines connecting them. A one dimensional cobordism, a one dimensional cobordism includes uh, closed components like circles. Okay, these are the elements or arrows or morphisms, whatever you prefer is the word here in my universe of one dimensional cobordisms. Here's another example. It goes from five, what right? zero dimensional points zero-dimensional manifolds to one. Uh, again, a point, a zero-dimensional manifold. It's a map from five to one, and this was a map from three to five. And well, it's a category, so this means you can actually compose maps, and the composition is extremely beautiful. It's really just a topological operation by putting one on top of the other. So observe here that they have the same boundary, so you can just take this picture and put it on top of the other, and you get a new picture now from three to one, and if I haven't messed up, it's this one here at the top. So let's see, I just put this picture on top. So this trend goes through, this connects like this, and this connects like this. So you get this, oh, indeed, <laughs> luck. And you get this little picture on the top. Anyway, what I'm saying here is you have this nice category of just one dimensional cobalt pictures, just topological objects, just strings. And there's a natural composition operation on them, gluing along common boundary and gives you new pictures of the same type. And this is this category of one-dimensional cobordisms. And the Brouwer algebra basically is the algebra, or the Brouwer monoid basically is the monoid that you can cook up from this category by looking at endomorphisms of objects, like endomorphism of three to three, which is just a, which is just saying you look at diagrams with the same number of boundary, bottom and top boundary points. So in my reading convention, I say it again, I like to read this way. So the source is at the bottom and the target is at the top. Okay, so here's a Brouwer diagram. It's really the same diagram as before. And just you have same number of bottom and top. So here's six, six, and I call it Brouwer six. I call it pre Brouwer six for a reason that will be clear in a second. Uh, let's just call it Brouwer for now. So you have those pictures. Here's an example, just really lines connecting the various points. It's a cobordism. It's a one dimensional cobordism. And you can stack them nicely together as illustrated here. I hope I haven't messed up. So this component here goes all the way like this. This states what it is. So I guess this bottom picture here, um, let me try to get the top picture. So this states what it is. It is like this and the other component goes, you can untwist and you just get this picture. And this is a composition. It's really the same as in the cobalt picture. It's a topological composition and I call it a multiplication. Um, it's, as I said here, it's just end of, of one object and multiplication is a stacking operation. In other words, these are really just one dimensional cobordism pictures with multiplication being stacking. And I just collect them in this monoid, um, which is just this monoid of those pictures. And that's a Brouwer monoid. Well, it's almost Brouwer monoid. Let me explain why I would like why it's almost. The problem is uh, well, a cobordism could have internal components like circles. 
And that's a bit annoying for the monoid version because then you get an infinite monoid. You get an arbitrary number of those circles. So you somehow need to get rid of the internal components. Um, it's quite easy to see that you only have a finite number of pictures without circles. We'll, we'll count them in a second. But of course, with circles, it's, I, mean, I, I just could, could keep on drawing here circles. Right? And since these are abstract pictures, I can even draw them here or here. It doesn't matter. They're all circles. There's no embedding involved. I just draw plain pictures. There's no embedding involved. These are abstract pictures. And anyway, in order to make it finite, you use the following trick. Whenever you see a circle, you just remove it from the picture. So here in this multiplication, let me get rid of all this nonsense here. Um, so wrong. Very good. It's much better to see. So you get just get rid of this picture and you just simplify the picture accordingly. Let me see whether I've done it correctly. So this guy goes all the way to here. It's this one. And this one here, maybe another color, goes all the way to here. And the rest stays what it is. OK, very good. So this is how it works. So it's really just a cobordism without circles. We just remove the circles. And what you get is a Brouwer monoid. It's called the Brouwer monoid. It's uh, the Brouwer algebra. And this was supposed to be in subscript, so the one from before. Anyway, so this is really just the Brouwer monoid. And it's cobordism. You just want to make it finite so you remove circles. And now we have an object of monoid theory. In particular, you have an object of combinatorics, if you want. And the kind of the theorem here is that this is really a finite monoid, and you could count the number of elements. So let's do that count. So here we have three strands. So BR3. And I claim it should have this number of elements. So it's, uh, what is it? 2 times 3 minus 1. It's 5 double fractorial. And the double fractorial is kind of strange notation. It's not the fractorial of the fractorial. It's the following version of the fractorial. It's a fractorial where you go in steps of 2. So it's just 5 times 3 times 1, which hopefully is 15. And if I haven't miscounted, this should be 15 pictures. There's 6 at the bottom. And there are 9 at the top. Whew. Luck, it's really 15. Anyway, so these are actually the cells, um, and the cells then determine the, um, well, it's monoid, right? We can write down cells, and they will determine the representation theory. But right now, we just have a cool monoid, and at least I think it's cool, uh, with a nice multiplication, the stacking of pictures of cobordisms, and that's what it is. And here's another, here's another cell. This is, uh, well, the cells are indexed by through strands. So what do I mean here? He has one through strand in this cell, as you can as you could see. So there's always one strand go through. So this is what I call J1. Here are three. So this is what I call J3. Here are two. So I call it J2. So two through strands. Um, so you can easily show that the J cells are indexed by the through strands. So if in steps of two, because you only have those operations which remove two. So for BR4, which is my example here. You have J2, you have J4, and you have J0. And they always look kind of this, the same type of picture. So in the left cells, you fix the bottom. So here, I hope I've always fixed the same bottom picture. So it should always be a cup and two strands, a cup and two strands, and so on. And for the right cells, which are the rows, you fix the top picture. Let me try again. Here, it should be a cup with two strands to the left, and indeed it is, and so on. You just stack them together, and that's your cell structure. And the little H cells, so those guys here, are symmetric groups. So this is S2. How do we see that? Well, let's multiply the elements. So the first one is this one. Let's multiply it with itself. You get a circle. You remove the circle, so it's actually itself. And this is the idempotent in the cell. It is a unit uh, of, this, uh, of this group. And then you have a crossing picture, so it's just S2. And well, the H reduction gives you a nice classification out of simple representations, which I'm going to discuss a little bit in the next video. But this is a kind of a cool picture. So you have this diagrammatically defined, combinatorially, topologically defined uh, monoid. And it has this extremely beautiful cell picture by uh, topological, by through strands, top diagrams, bottom diagrams, and you have symmetric groups inside. Um, anyway. I really hope you liked the Brower Monoid. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I also hope to see you next time.